This is API Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like ET said. Hello, this is API Case Files. I'm your host, Marsha Barnhart, API Chief of Investigations. This is the Spring 2016 episode of API Case Files. In this program, we'll showcase a UFO report from a witness in Newport, Oregon. Because it immediately dawned on me that it was probably 10 times the size of what the International Space Station looks like to the naked eye. Uh, you know, I've seen we'll also present an excerpt from a recent interview our Deputy Director Paul Carr had with Ted Rowe, the Executive Director for the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena, better known as NARCAP. It's, it's, it's unusual. It was, it was a ball of light that pulled up under an airliner and paced under the tail for a little bit and then broke away. I have a report covering the Michigan MUFON conference commemorating the 50th anniversary of the 1966 swamp gas UFO flap. And I'm like, I need to report a UFO sighting. And she says to me, was it a weather balloon? <laughs> swamp gas, right? But it's funny that... Also, I talked with our director, Antonio Paris, about his interesting, recently published and widely publicized hypothesis that may explain the famous wow signal SETI intercepted in 1977. We, we kind of have a, a, a really good suspect that might, might have been the source of the wow signal. There is an effort underway to crowdfund the experiment that may prove the hypothesis. I'll provide details in this program on how you can be part of the scientific push for answers. This is API Case Files. Case Files. In this episode of API Case Files, we'll examine in depth. Case 16009, FB1, Oregon. This was a single witness case. However, this witness is a scientist attached to the Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. I'll let the witness tell the story of his experience and what he saw. At around 5.15, I just happened to look up just to see if the sky were clear to kind of check for the weather. And I took probably a triple take because at first I looked up and I thought it looked kind of like the um, the wing structures on the International Space Station. Um, so I, you know, I was like, oh, the International Space Station. And then I looked down. And then I looked up again because it immediately dawned on me that it was... Um, probably 10 times the size of what the International Space Station looks like to the naked eye. Uh, you know, I've seen that a number of times. And it, it was a single light in the back end of a T-shaped um, object with that was moving from uh, pretty much east to west, uh, maybe northeast to southwest slightly, but The oddest thing about the whole uh, situation was that the structure itself moved completely off axis of the way that it was traveling. Um, So, you know, so immediately I was aware that it was not a helicopter or a plane. um, And we have a regional airport right nearby. So I see those things, you know, usually daily, multiple times daily. And I've uh, when I lived in Florida, I used to go and watch shuttle launches. So I've seen a lot of objects coming and going, but this was unlike anything I'd ever seen in my entire life. And, uh, you know, I watched it and I tried to grab my camera phone, you know, my phone to take a picture, but the, the, it wasn't bright enough that it was visible. And so I immediately jumped in my car when I lost it behind the tree line and went about a thousand feet down the road to a waypoint parking lot along the side of the, the beach. And by the time I got there, it had disappeared. And I don't know what, what, what it was. Now, other than the light that was in the rear, 
Did you see any other lights or any windows or anything of that nature? No, there were no windows or, you know, any kind of, you know, markings or anything obvious other than just kind of this slightly inconsistent uh, whitish, silverish color. Okay. It was uh, brighter than any star by far. Um, and the underside, it, it looked as if the underside of it was being lit by some sort of continuous looking lighting. It was like this almost ethereal, whitish, uh, pale white color. It, I, I don't even really know how to describe it. I mean, I've been trying to piece together the best way to, um, the best way to describe it. And it almost looked like if you just kind of shined a, a pure white light on uh, like a, a wing, a, a white feather wing, where it kind of had inconsistency in the way that the color was showing, but it was clearly a very solid, continuous object. Was it metallic looking or organic? I would say metallic. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say it was metallic. Were there any sounds or environmental disturbances? This was absolutely silent. One of the more interesting facts associated with the research on this case is that there were at least 15 other UFO reports received by the National UFO Reporting Center, New Fork, on that same date, February 10th, 2016, and within the same 20-minute time frame. 15 reports within the same 20 minutes. This is not that uncommon for folks reporting what turns out to be a meteor, but for a report on sightings ranging from this witness's clearly identified artificially lit T-shaped object over Newport, Oregon, to another person's sighting of a large circular craft flying over Lebanon, Oregon, to someone in Ione, Oregon, reporting a triangular-shaped light in the clouds, to a witness reporting a round glowing orb over Geyserville, Oregon. Upon beginning my research, I found what I thought at first was probably responsible for those reports. Exactly one hour earlier that morning at approximately 0410, a Delta IV rocket launch took place from Vandenberg Air Force Base on the coast of California. Vandenberg is approximately 900 miles south of Newport, Oregon. The launch was reportedly a classified mission that included in its payload a top-secret 8-ton National Reconnaissance Office Boeing Topaz Imaging Radar Reconnaissance Satellite. Aha, I thought, this would probably generate a lot of calls to New Fork. But examining the facts led me to determine that the launch was on a far more southern course, in fact, towards Antarctica. Studying the launch data proved that if the information given from the press release was accurate, that satellite, one hour after launch, would have been on the other side of the globe. It simply could not account for the sightings between 0500 and 0520 on the morning of Wednesday, February 10th, 2016. Of the 15 sightings reported, there were four from California, and those I eliminated from the total count of same-time sightings, but eight of the remaining 11 sightings were from Oregon. Nonetheless, the size of the object the witness from Case 16009 described, no satellite could approximate. The witness was familiar with what the ISS looks like traveling overhead. This was not that nor any other similar object from orbital space that he could possibly have seen that big. If it was at the, the height uh, that the International Space Station is flying, I can only estimate that it would probably have been, you know, somewhere around like a mile or, or more in length and diameter. I mean, if, if it was flying at satellite orbit height or International Space Station height, this would have been a structure so massive that... There's nothing that compares to it that any country in, uh, you know, is flying. So, I, and if it was, I mean, if you held your arm out fully outstretched with your thumb and pointer, uh, I'd say about an inch apart, 
that was how both how long it was in the main body and the team section at the front end of it was. So it, it was either flying rather low and it was dead silent, which I don't think we have any, and it was flying off axis of the, you know, the direction that it was flying, or it was enormous and flying much higher. Unfortunately, I could not find a plausible explanation for what this witness saw. The other reports that came in during the same time period took place from there on the coast at Newport to seven other locations across Oregon, to Reno, Nevada, to Lewiston, Idaho. The reports really had nothing in common but the shared, very compressed time frame that morning. As is typical with a case I cannot identify, I do continue to keep the case in the back of my mind in the offhand chance that some information just might come my way to aid in identification or resolution of the matter, and that's something that a witness usually values. I'm just really uh, glad that you guys are following up because, you know, I'm just incredibly curious to figure out what it is because it would be a lot you know, more palatable to me to say, oh, it was, you know, a rocket or a satellite being launched rather than say I saw a UFO. As as a, you know, professional scientist, they, they generally discourage us to call or talk about things like this because it was it was just beyond anything I've s I can understand really. API case sixteen dash zero zero nine closed as unidentified. This is API Case Files. We'll hear soon from our director, Antonio Paris, about his interesting wow signal hypothesis and get a report from a recent UFO conference. But first... API's Deputy Director Paul Carr recently interviewed Ted Rowe, the Executive Director of NARCAP, which is the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena. This organization specifically concerns itself with reports of incidents where unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAP, interact with or affect the operation of airplanes. NARCAP has published reports on their scientific findings on some of these UAPs. Paul Carr covered a wide range of topics with Ted Rowe concerning his experience with the studies surrounding UAPs. The following is an excerpt from the interview with Ted Rowe on Unseen Podcast, which is produced by Paul Carr. Can you give us some example of some of the more interesting things you've, you've found? Well, we have one case, a NARCAP Technical Report 12, that uh, has us all kind of scratching our heads, and I don't really know how to write the paper around an argument that that, that might be an intelligent artifact or not, but but it's, it's it's unusual. It was it was a ball of light that pulled up under an airliner and paced under the tail for a little bit and then broke away. A group of astronomers were on the ground and um, amateur astronomers that were setting up, and they managed to get a series of photographs of this incident. and. Uh, we've had it in our case files with, with their names associated with it. Uh, they were willing to be publicly associated with it, and, um, and the case itself is provocative. I, I don't know how to, how to engage that other than, you know, for what it looks like. A lot of times those inc- incidents never make it to the public domain. The FAA manages the, the punitive measures or, or whatever ends up being taken, um, and uh, and you never actually get to hear about that story, or, or the guy sounds like a wacko when, you, when, you, when he finally does tell anybody. Let's say an, air, an airline pilot in the United States sees something he doesn't understand. Are they required to report it? Well, you know, this is kind of where the irrationality around this whole topic seems to be saturated, and uh, at least in the aviation side, and creates problems for me um, in terms of just trying to get a, a, a straight trajectory on research. Um, but uh, Jan Ep 146, a joint Army Navy Air Force publication, instructed airline pilots to uh, uh, not to publicly report any observations that they had uh, or face a penalty. Uh, and at the time, we didn't have satellite coverage of the planet. This was prior to 1978. Airline pilots and, and others were basically forward observers who would see bomber formations coming over from Russia or flights of missiles or whatever. And 
Uh, so they were used sort of as an intelligence gathering force and were warned not to speak of anything that they reported to the military. This uh, this had a chilling effect, and pilots stopped talking about things that they saw in the air uh, afterwards, and their managers uh, continued that tradition. And while the, the, the reports haven't decreased at all, people talking about them did for, for quite a while. Uh, we're, we're seeing a little bit of a turnaround there, but I, I, I'm sure that the stories we get are the tip of the icebergs in terms of what people have to tell us about. So there's there's a, 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 a kind of a stigma around the subject, and again, it's a part of this irrationality. The FAA expresses it really clearly, and they tell pilots that if they've seen a UFO, that they can report it to a public UFO reporting center or a private uh, aerospace business, but they don't want to know about it. And and that to me, that's irrational in that, I mean, they're obsessed, and rightfully so, with aviation safety, but there's just one category that they don't want to talk about, and they aim pilots away from them. Um, so the information flows away from the aviation system, and except for organizations like mine that that, that try to circle it, circulate it back to the aviation system, it it's lost as far as aviation safety planning and mitigation goes. A lot of these cases involve either near mid airs or uh, a loss of separation incidents where separation closes under a thousand feet or is perceived to be under a thousand feet. Um, and sometimes the, the, the trajectories on these things can be really dynamic and multiple. They can move in different directions. Uh, they can move rather quickly. Uh, there's kind of a scope of, of appearances, but we don't have it down in terms of nailing down the profiles on them. They seem to be intermittently detected on radars. Uh, they're quite dynamic. Uh, in some cases, they, you wouldn't necessarily think of them as being intelligent, and then other cases, you're, you, you suspect the opposite. Um, so there's there's a there's a lot of dissonance inside the aviation system around the subject too, which is another sign of an irrational engagement. If we just went about it and we're thorough and consistent in our logic and and just do the work, we can get to the other side of this and we can determine what it is we're looking at. My guess is that it's some poorly not documented natural phenomena, and 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 then for these provocative cases, I, I I'm wide open because I have I don't really have a larger context to to measure it against. And that's been really the failing in this conversation all along is uh, the, the, the investigations are really good, you know, in a lot of cases. Uh, um, there's, there's really good documentation and good work, but, but there, there's been no, nothing to compare it to, no way to say, well, we, we kind of think that an ET incursion could be like this or like that, and hey, you know, this is looking a lot like that. It's subtle. It's, uh, it, it, se- it seems like it's almost covert, um, and, and the activity that this thing demonstrated clearly seems to be outside the parameters of known natural phenomena. Uh, perhaps we should have some suspicions about this and set it aside with a, a definite maybe and pay attention a little more. Just look at that that case, that technical report 12 that I was talking about. Yeah, you, you have the phenomenon. It's tailing the aircraft at a good distance, and then it then it exceeds the aircraft speed. It pulls up underneath the tail of the aircraft, and then it holds there. No dynamic buffeting. It isn't pushed up against the airplane. It's holding its own, and then it leaves at an oblique angle in another direction. And so, is, is that intelligent behavior or not? It's borderline. You know, it's indicative with the multiple trajectories, and and it's. Uh, and so on. It's indicative that it's probably not a natural phenomenon unless there's perhaps some kind of a dynamic relationship between aircraft and their environment that creates these uh, luminous phenomenon. And we have a lot of examples of this sort of thing, of, of these balls of light pacing aircraft, um, and sometimes showing up in multiples. It's more than one sometimes. And uh, um, and then we have the intermittent failures on, on onboard systems. Uh, associated with some of these observations, uh, navigation fails, uh, uh, autopilot fails, uh, communications fails, this kind of thing. Um, oftentimes temporary, and then it, uh, when the uh, event is over, the, the systems return to a functional state. So there's a lot of question marks around all of this. So we, we haven't really, like I said, we haven't really built a context to, to measure this against. So there's just all this argument and dissonance over whether they're, whether they are, or whether they aren't. And what we really need to be doing is asking ourselves, what would we expect it to be like? You know, without anthropomorphizing, ask ourselves what an ET incursion would look like. You know, right. and then then you can work work it through. You know. Now, at least in the U.S., uh, scientists don't want to look at this, right? Because that that's that's a career limiting move. Uh, maybe in Europe, it's better. Yeah, yeah the conversation seems to be more open in Europe. Uh, we we presented before the French Air and Space Academy, and uh, they they have a UAP research team uh, within CNES, their space agency, and we participated in one of their workshops, and we've had a working relationship with them in, in 
whichever uh, incarnation they've they've been around in since 2000. And they certainly have aviation cases as well, and a lot of our cases have a lot in common, uh, which is another thing. We have all these case files that have been released by all these countries, and if you do a comparative analysis, you start seeing certain commonalities among certain types of cases that beg a closer look, if for no other reason than to just rule them out. But but we should take a look at them. Um, I, I don't think it's wise to just discard this stuff with an opinion and not go more closely. Now, Ted, you got to admit, right, there's been a lot of pseudoscience and a lot of woo-woo around this topic, right? Do you agree with that? Oh, I would agree with that heartily. Yeah, there's no question that there there's dissonance around the topic, and I think it uh, interferes with a rational engagement of the subject, really. The problems that we have are uh, certain cases present in a very provocative way with respect to the extraterrestrial hypothesis or the idea that some of these unidentifieds might might be artifacts of extraterrestrial intelligence activity in our uh, in the Earth's domain. But for us to actually look at that and make a good decision around it, we need more information. We need to we need to have a better understanding of what an extraterrestrial incursion might look like, and and how to score our cases against that possibility. And right now, that doesn't exist, and there hasn't really been a, a rational discussion around it. Although a number of the research teams in the world have uh, tried to call attention to certain provocative cases, it's pretty much fallen on deaf ears. I don't think I don't think the French team or our team has ever said that aliens are here or that any of this represents aliens, but uh, science should look a little more closely at all of this. It takes doing what we're doing and then and then pushing for a critical mass from the ground up, in, uh, working our demographic in the aviation community. And, and it's a matter of building data uh, and, and normalizing data collection between uh, different points and then working with them, the international uh, groups like CEFA, uh, the, the the Chilean group that we have a research agreement with, and um, with the uh, French group uh, 3AF Sigma 2, and we work closely with uh, 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 GPAN and with others when, when asked. It's in its infancy right now in terms of peer review and, and the, the development of this as a science, but um, but it's all coalescing. It just it takes some time and it's going to take some uh, funding. We definitely need some financial infusion to help this process move along. Uh, I would I would hope that it wouldn't take a, a blatant event that, that would just scare the, the bejesus out of everybody uh, and get them thinking about ET incursions. Uh, but but honestly, the, the subject is, is, is deep and um, complex, and it really hasn't been given its due. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I'm asking for, because I, I'm in a position as an administrator in a UAP research team looking at cases that in some examples are rather provocative, but there's no larger context to deal with it in there. I have nobody to take it to, um, my suspicions, and, and uh, there's no scale, uh, no way to score a case against the idea of what an ET incursion is or might look like or how we might detect one. Um, I have a hunch that, that it's, it would probably be very subtle, so we wouldn't enjoy an embarrassment of uh, evidence, uh, and there'd be a lot of judgment calls involved. It's not going to be the kind of thing that gets resolved to, to an absolute scientific certainty. It, it's more of a tactical, intelligence-related problem, mm -hmm. um, just in my just in my opinion, uh, now, from my my position. Yeah. Now, Ted, uh, do we have even a chance of applying the usual scientific process? There are research teams that are engaging this in a, in a serious way. We're writing good white papers. We're, we're doing good documentation. Um, the nature of the phenomenon itself doesn't lend itself to repeatability. I can, I can provide cases to you that involve uh, not only witness testimony, uh, but involve radar detections and other things. Uh, but if it's just opined away without being acted on, it's not really worth anything. I mean, if you're, if, if you're going to talk about an intelligence that is orders above our own, then its behaviors are not going to necessarily appear rational to us. Its activities and, and the things it undertakes and the way it goes about doing them may, may not be clear to us at all. And then if on top of that, beyond subtle, they're covert, perhaps they're warlike, perhaps they're, uh, they're not in space to be uh, explorers and everybody's friend. Um, that they that they are driven by self interest or or of some kind or another. You, you can spend a lot of time on the what ifs, but but my point is that that it's a tactical problem. A lot of our best minds have said that bad things that can come of presence of a, a superior technical civilization. 
Hawking, I think, was commenting on that a while back, that uh, we really don't want to encounter a, uh, an extraterrestrial civilization uh, if we can help it. Um, and um, I don't know if he's right or wrong in that, that context, but if we have that kind of nervousness about it, and we're getting thousands of reports a year uh, of a provocative nature, some of which seem to hold up to scrutiny, is it reasonable to expect an embarrassment of um, evidence? Uh, I mean, if, if we're looking at a ball of light and we have no idea that technology can be a ball of light, then we're, we're limited by our lack of imagination, and we're being exploited throughout the time that, that we aren't able to make a determination one way or the other as to whether what that really is. And and this is kind of the part of the, the problem. Um, yeah, brace, bracewell probes, all of this, this is all very good, but um, we would look for evidence of that. Well, we're getting reports of, of, of um, things that might be exogenous probes that, that aren't even, they aren't being examined uh, or they're being opined away without actually being engaged. Uh, and there is no higher authority to say, well, this case is worthy and this case is not. Uh, is, is, is it only the case of interest, the one involving a manifestation over a military base? Or um, or do we care about the one that happens out in the countryside somewhere? Um, which cases are do we ignore uh, if, if we want to have a, a proper stance of vigilance? If we think we live in an, an inflating universe, then we live in a populated universe that's pretty old. And uh, we don't know anything about colonization of galactic habitability zones. We don't have any idea of what space migration is like or what we can expect, what kind of ecosystem it might be out there. And I think it's prudent to be a little bit watchful, a little bit careful, and think these things through a little bit before we're confronted by them. Now, if they were really hostile, I mean, wouldn't we already be, uh, we'd be food, right, already? Well, uh, <laughs> well, Paul, there's all kinds of hostility. You know, a, a, an 800-pound gorilla walks into the phone booth you're at, and, you know, you're going to modify your behavior. You know, you just do. Um, that's hostility. He, he's in control now. And quite frankly, any superior technical civilization that shows up in the Earth domain owns it uh, because we, we don't have anything to say about that. Uh, we have no control over that at all at this point. We don't have the ability to defend the planet. Uh, and hostility can can stretch out over decades. Uh, covert behaviors that we would call hostile behaviors may not be necessarily wars. Uh, exploitation doesn't necessarily have to be overt, you know. Uh, and and then you're dealing with mindsets that that are alien, so they're they're foreign to the way we look at things. They probably have the ability, um, I would guess, to uh, exploit our perceptual weaknesses. Uh, and um, and take advantage of our cultural weaknesses, uh, and our intellectual weaknesses, uh, like the dissonance around the subject of whether they're here or not. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that any of this is happening, but what I'm saying is that we don't really have any reason to be confident that it has been happening. And when we have so many cases that, that aren't really even being looked at, much less any judgment being pronounced upon, um, we, we really should be more careful. Uh, if these are if these are civilization ending events, we should be paying more attention. The entire interview with Ted Rowe can be heard on Paul Carr's Unseen podcast. I've included a link to that interview on our show notes. Shortly, I'll present my interview with our director, Professor Antonio Paris, and his hypothesis on the possible explanation for the famous 1977 wow signal. But first, we'll return to another famous affair that captured imaginations in 1966. This is API Case Files. Fifty years ago, in a swampy marsh area near Ann Arbor, Michigan, a farmer and his family became part of an interesting chain of events that gave rise to the term swamp gas as an incredulous answer to attempt to explain what turned out to be a mass UFO sightings flap. It was March 1966, and all across the country were sightings by multiple witnesses of strange craft and lights appearing over small towns and farm fields and even cities. Michigan ufologist Will Matthews talked to me specifically about that flap and, in general, about the era in which it occurred. You know, for about a two-year period, 
UFO reports have been reappearing in newspapers, you know, in, in larger numbers than they had since the 1950s. And there was such a large number that the Air Force had had to respond several times during, you know, 1964, 65, to the point where it was building up to something. But in this case, you had a large number of witnesses, events that happened two nights in a row, um, credible witnesses, lots of, you know, a civil defense director for Hillsdale, lots of sheriff's deputies and police in Dexter, and the whole thing came off as very credible. But once again, the timing was really important. It was a, it was a dam that was ready to break. Um, when you look in depth into them, there's a lot of good information, a lot of patterns that are, or elements you could say that are very common in the UFO phenomena, the animal reactions, uh, the lights changing, color based on the movements or speed of the object. Um, well, one of the things I think that's important that comes out of this is the term swamp gas. Now, mm -hmm. how did very credible witnesses and actual visual sightings of some type of craft, how did mm -hmm. that get hijacked to swamp gas? Well, my, my own sense is I, can't, I, can, I almost can't believe that they thought it would work, or that it would pass as an explanation. But, you know, at that time, too, it was before, you know, the Vietnam protests were just coming up. Watergate was still seven years away. People had kind of a, you know, a black and white attitude towards the government. Sometimes they'd be skeptical, but people tend to listen to official them and the official proclamations. You know, and I think, too, what happens is uh, the general public does view UFOs as kind of a ridiculous thing. You know, it's like, it's a silly thing. It's, oh, little green man, blah, 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 so that... For that part, the, when those people hear a thing like swamp gas, they're like, well, yeah, you know, and so they, they uh, blow it off. And then you've got the people who do know more about it, and to them it's more of the same. The Air Force has done this before. They've come up with ridiculous explanations before. In this case, um, the reason swamp gas was latched onto was that even the headlines for these two events would say, object lands in swamp. And so word was circulating in, in the, you know, amongst the people in the towns that it could be something like that. Heineck picked up on that, but he also had uh, someone at the University of Michigan who he was staying with suggest, you know, what's called ignis fatuus, you know, foolish fire, as a possible solution. And the night before, at least according to Sheriff Douglas Harvey for Washtenaw County, uh, according to him, he and Heineck were having a discussion where Heineck said, I really don't know what they saw. Heineck received a phone call, and he came back and said, I'm going to have to say swamp gas tomorrow, you know, something along those lines. And um, my sense is that they said, what would you, what's the best thing we can come up with here? And he said, well, we've been talking about that. And people, it's kind of the word on the street is this will of the wisp type thing. And uh, they said, that'll do because all they needed was something. They didn't need anything fancy. Do you think the, the powers that be, the officials, knew that there was something credible here and the idea was to deflect it as quickly as possible and move on? You know, that's a good question. I think it's more that you know, the military and Project Blue Book uh, as part of the Air Force at that time, more than anything, their whole operations was public relations. I don't think they really believed anything was really going on, or if they did, they didn't care. Their job was just to contain the problem. Will Matthews was one of seven speakers presenting information at Michigan MUFON's conference celebrating that state's 50th anniversary of the memorable, widely publicized event. John Tenney, another presenter at the conference, mentioned the lasting emotional and negative impact it had on the farmer, Frank Manor, who led Dr. J. Allen Hynek into the swampy area behind his farm in 1966. One of the things that broke my heart the most as a young researcher was watching the CBS special report that came out in 66 um, after the swamp gas incident, and you see Frank Manor being interviewed uh, and he says, if this happened to me again, I would never tell anyone, ever. People drove by my house, they threw things at me, they call me and my family crazy, they tell us we're out of our minds. I will never, if anything ever happened to me again, I would never tell anyone about this ever. Uh, and this is something that we see over and over and over again. Uh, it's, it's not Director J. Allen Hynek played a large role in the 1966 Michigan flap since he was the front man sent to examine for Blue Book the veracity of those sightings. Another speaker at the conference, UFO investigator and author Mark O'Connell, is writing a book about Hynek. Hynek, he and others feel, got a bad rap from the swamp gas flap. That's about all anyone remembers of Hynek's work on the case. But regardless of what people remember, he wasn't just a flunky for Blue Book. He had integrity, and facts carried the day where he was concerned, as Mark O'Connell's research showed. Hynek goes where the facts lead him, even if it picks up a big mess of trouble for him. 
And that's important, obviously, as we look at the swamp gas case, because that's exactly... Dr. Harry Wilness, who provided part of the opening remarks of the conference, was a contemporary of Dr. Hynek's and was recruited by Hynek to become a UFO investigator. Dr. Wilness talked to me about this case, how it affected Hynek's career afterwards, and reminisced about the man he came to know. I think of Hynek, I remember him as a man who who came to UFOs thinking that they were all a bunch of hogwash, they were crackpots who reported them and visionaries and mentally retarded people. And over the years, he began to see that there was something to this. And again, he was one of the few scientists to say, let's take some time and study this. Don't poo-poo it. There's something there. It needs to be studied. And I respected him so much for that. Did you ever get a sense that he had some idea what was behind the objects, at least? That would be hard to say. Um, I'm sure he thought that. That there was something? What, I mean, these objects are here. They, they move. They're, they're somehow, they have intelligence behind them. Um, there must be something maybe that makes them do that. How much do you think this uh, case, the swamp gas, 1966 Michigan UFO flap, changed that man? Um, it certainly was the low point of his career. Uh, again, he started in 1947 with uh, Project Grudge and Project Sign, and, uh, and then after four years, Project Blue Book began. So he was with the Air Force for 22 years. And uh, over time again, he began to change because he saw these cases. He just couldn't put his finger on some of these things. They were really unexplainable. So this had a bearing on him, and as he said, after the swamp gas cases, and he held a press conference, I got out of town as quickly and as quietly as I could, because he was embarrassed. Also on the speaker's podium for this event was Bill Murphy and well-known authors Peter Robbins and Grant Cameron. The conference was well attended, a nod, no doubt, to Michigan MUFON's able state director, William Konkoleski, and MC Dr. Linda Murphy. I've posted information on this conference in our show notes. This is API Case Files. In the scientific search for intelligent interstellar life forms, SETI is probably the grand master. An incident that took place on August 15, 1977, lit up the scientific landscape. The WOW signal is the name that was given to a strong narrowband radio signal detected by Dr. Jerry Ehrman on that date. He was working on a SETI project at the Big Ear Radio Telescope of The Ohio State University when he detected a signal sequence that lasted for the entire 72-second window that the radio telescope was attuned to at the time. Impressed by the event, Dr. Ehrman circled the signal on the computer printout and wrote the comment, WOW, on its side, which ended up becoming the name of the signal itself, forever after being known as the WOW signal. This event created a great deal of excitement and has been the subject of significant media attention because of its relative resemblance to the expected signature of an interstellar signal. In the intervening years since 1977, scientists have ruled out signals from Earth or satellites as the cause for the WOW signal. As a result, the WOW signal became, in some minds, de facto evidence of life beyond our planet. The problem, of course, is that it has not been detected since, even though astronomers have tried many times in vain to find that signal again. So what caused the signal? 
That's the big question. And that brings us to my interview with Professor Antonio Paris, the director of the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team, who is also a full-time professor of astronomy at St. Petersburg College in Florida. Professor Paris and his research colleague, Evan Davis, looked at the whole WOW signal affair as if conducting a forensics investigation. They went back to the scene of the crime, so to speak, and came up with an interesting hypothesis to account for that blast of atmosphere-piercing 1420 megahertz, 21 centimeter wavelength that captured the attention of the world. Tell me about your hypothesis to answer the wow signal. The hypothesis is that something, right, that was emitting uh, hydrogen uh, back in 1977 was the culprit of the wow signal. And I, I went back to the crime scene. I like to call it the crime scene back in August 15, 1977. And I have a suspect. I know what the suspect looks like. I know what the suspect, um, uh, the emission spectra of that suspect. And what I did was I went back in time and found uh, what suspects were in that crime scene that matched the description on the same date and time. Kind of like a little forensics work. And I was able to find several comets that were not known back then because they were not discovered until 2006, and they fit the suspect's description. I'm not saying they are the source of the wow signal, which is why I call them only candidates, but I have two comets, not just one, two comets um, that were in the crime scene on the same date and the same time as the wow signal. Now, comets are dirty snowballs, and as they're coming around the sun, which they were at that point, they release a lot of hydrogen. And they have these massive hydrogen, neutral hydrogen clouds, and those things give off radio waves. So we, we kind of have a, a really good suspect that might, might have been the source of the wow signal. Um, there are a couple issues out there that, you know, that people think that, that might be comets because if they were comets, we probably could have heard them the next day and the next day. But... Here is what we need to do. Before we rule out they're not comets, we need to test a hypothesis. That's what science is. And the only way to test this hypothesis is to find these two culprits again. And they're going to be back in the same neighborhood in January 2017 and January 2018. We're going to point some radio telescopes to them. And we're going to study them. We haven't, nobody's studied these comets yet. We know they exist. Um, we know their orbits, but but comets are like asteroids. Nobody, you know, you 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 find them, you catalog them, and that, that really nobody's at least, nobody's really studied these two specifically. And that's what we're gonna do. We're and we're hopeful that perhaps they were the source of the wow signal. My only concern is that it's been uh, 40 years, and these comets have gotten significantly smaller because uh, you know after 40 years they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and we'll see. I, I think my, I, my, my goal is two part. First, there's not a whole lot of data to suggest that comets give off 21 cm spectra. And I think that's because nobody's really looked at them from that perspective. So the telescopes we're building are specifically to look for the same signature. And that's, a, that's a goal is to see if we can get just a little hint that these comets have a little nitro, uh, excuse me, uh, neutral hydrogen. And guess what? If, if they are not the comets, that's still good science because we ruled out uh, those two culprits and we can look for other ones, right? So, you know, there's a couple of really three good reasons to, to look at these comets. First, comets give off hydrogen and the radio signal was originally hydrogen. The signal, the wall signal was intermittent. Meaning we heard it once yeah. and we never heard it again. Yeah, We think they might have been comets because when researchers looked through in that same area for the next 20 years, all the data, there were no comets when the researchers were looking at it again. 
So we nobody has looked at the same area of the sky when there were comets. And, th- and that's what we need to do is so comets come comets come every six, seven, eight years. And every time a search was done for the wall signal, comets already passed or they were not in the same area. So basically what I'm saying is every time they went back to the crime scene, the comets were not there. So we need to look at the comets when they're actually there and to see if they're giving off hydrogen. Now, if if comets, when they um, when they give off their hydrogen as as they go through the solar system, don't they always give off the same uh, frequency? And couldn't you find any comet that is transiting the system and figure out if that's what's giving off the signature frequency? That is a good question, but as, as we're, we're recently learning, especially from 69JP, which is the last comet we landed on, not all comets are the same, okay? They're, they're like asteroids. Asteroids are made of iron nickel. They could be rock. They could be different materials. So they're different. So when we landed on 69JP uh, uh, last summer, we were like, what is this? This comet is completely different, right? It, and all the chemical analysis and spectral analysis of 69 JP made us rethink what comets are. In fact, we had to throw out the entire theory that comets are the ones that that brought the the initial oceans to to the uh, uh, to Earth, you know, 4.5 billion years ago. So we learned a lot from 69 JP, and the big and the biggest thing we learned was that. Not all comets are the same. All these little planetary bodies are slightly different than others. I think what makes this unique is that during the WOW signal, there were two comets in the very same area that perhaps when you combine their massive hydrogen cloud, that could have been the cause. So basically, the two comets are sandwiching where that WOW signal was. And I think that's 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 something significant um, the bad part is that we won't see these two comets sandwiching themselves again for about 600 years. And that's, that's basically is the curve wall. Um, but you know, the, the fact that we can track these comets and maybe perhaps get some analysis and spec and some spectral signatures, you know, we might never, we might never answer the wow signal, but unless we test various hypotheses, including this one, um, that's the only way to get an answer. And so then what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to point that, that telescope in the area that this comet is coming, and so you will narrowly focus on that and begin recording a signal and see if it's throwing out that exact same signature? Yeah, so, so the, 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 comet is, the comet is um, moving in a rel- it's, it's not that fast, about 19 kilometers per hour. So it's kind of like tracking a star. For the, you know, the, the telescope is just like a, it's a big dish, but it has an equatorial mount. So the telescope will move with the comet throughout the night. Okay. So the comet should be visible for a couple hours. It won't be visible to the naked eye because it's, too, it's just too far away and it's too tiny. But if you enter the right of session and declination, you'll be able to track the comet. And the, the telescope will move with the comet for three or four hours. And I can, I can take in all the radio emissions from that comet. It'll download through the, through the horn, the feed horn, into the receiver. The receiver has a built-in spectro, uh, spectrometer. The receiver is the most expensive part. It's like 8000 bucks. The dish is only like 2000 Uh And the spectrometer does all its magic, and we can look for, for uh, hydrogen lines. That's the go. This is going to take a couple of years before you have a definitive answer. Yeah, because we can't just make a, a response with one comet. The sec- that second comet doesn't come around till 2018. So we need to look at both comets, combine their spectra, and see if there's anything funky going on there. So we we're, we're estimate about March 2018, we should have a paper out. So and that's you know that's that's what science is. We, you can't rush this. Um, but in between. The two comets, we'll be doing other research. So we'll be playing with the telescope and looking at other cool stuff. Um, I noticed that Dr. Jerry Ehrman did a, um, in 2007, a 30 year visit, a look back at the wow signal. And I was wondering if you have been in touch with Dr. Ehrman and uh, talked with him about your hypothesis at all. Oh, yeah. What's his thought? I, I have spoken to everyone from Seth Solchak at SETI. 
all the way to everyone that from 1977 to 1982, um, very, uh, including Jerry, and they all saw my paper before it was published. So I did do my I did my due diligence, and I think their consensus was that they don't think it's the comets, right? Which is good, but they said they they, they still think it's a great hypothesis, and they agree with me at least from one part is that I think it was Roger. Anyway, Roger was the last person that basically shut down Big Ear, and he said, uh, you have to test Antonio's hypothesis before you can rule it out. And I think SETI and everyone agrees that, yes, that's what science is. The, for the better part, a lot of people loved my paper. Before I published it, it went out to peer review to about different people. And I would say about six or seven were a little skeptical, but they, they still said, hey, good idea, test it. And it's still good science if it's not the comments. Because... They all, although they were skeptical, including including Jerry, when they learned that there were two comets there the same day, same time, and same night, they could they they did spark a, a little interest, and that's important. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, so somebody wrote about my wallpaper, right? And my and my crowdfunding research, and in the comments section, uh, an astronomer was writing that, hey, we have found so many similar signals to the wow signal off that 21 centimeter line because we have better technology now, better telescopes. And now we're, this is not something that's probably that random. The universe is full with all this, all this electromagnetic spectrum. And when I read that and the guy was saying, who knows, it could be comets because something in 1977, which was so random and we never heard again, it's so common now because with better 21 centimeter telescopes, we're finding all this hydrogen now just about everywhere. Current astronomers Radio astronomers are not even impressed with the with the wow signal from 1977. Hmm, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about is your crowdfunding on this. Talk to me about uh, how people can help science by helping you with this project. I had three options to get the money for this telescope. I had the option of going to St. Petersburg College, where I work, and they could have funded the $15,000 for the telescope. I could have gone to the museum where I work at and they could have funded it, right? I wanted this to be more more something for me and the Center of Planetary Science. And mainly because I need to find a location for the telescope that that is away from a lot of uh, electromagnetic interference like radio towers. And so the putting it at the school was not a good location because it's in the middle of St. Pete. Putting it at the museum was not a good location because it's it's in the middle of Tampa. But out in Withicoluchi Park is a private observatory, and I know the guys over there, and that's where I do a lot of sky watches. And they're like, put it here. And I want to put it there because if I go three miles this way, it's farmland. Three miles this way, it's farmland. And it's in rolling hills, and that's what I need. You want to put that in, in rolling hills. And that's what I did. So I was like, okay, let's do a crowdfunding effort. And basically, I just use social media and um, emails, and we're doing pretty good. I, and uh, the lead time is 12 weeks. So once I get the money and I order the telescope, it takes 12 weeks for them to build it and bring it here. So it's not something off the shelf that you just order on Amazon and it comes the next day. These are specifically built for research, professional research, and it takes 10 to 12 weeks to get it built. So we need it. Uh, we need it. To, we need it here at least by October, so that we can play with it for a month or two, learn how to use it, and then uh, the comet will come around January 17th. If you would like to contribute to the scientific effort to test Antonio's groundbreaking hypothesis, you can check out information on the crowdfunding at the link in our show notes. This brings us to the end of API Case Files, Episode 9. I've been your host, Marsha Barnhart, and you heard also from team members Professor Antonio Paris and Paul Carr. 
The podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.com. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. Featured exclusively during this episode were compositions by the artist Scott Holmes. If you want to drop us a line, that would be great. We can read your letters on the show. We always appreciate your input and ideas on content. Email director at aerial-phenomenon.org. Episode 10 of API Case Files should be out in the early summer of 2016 with more case discussions, more interviews, and hopefully some interesting input from you, our listeners. Meanwhile, thanks for joining us, and we hope you recommend API Case Files and API Conversations. This is API Case Files. Case Files. Case Files.